I want to acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania is situated upon the ancestral homeland and territory of the Lenni Lenape peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obligated to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed the University of Pennsylvania to grow and thrive on this vibrant terrain. As designers and thinkers, we endeavor to build in ways that lead towards justice, and we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, uh, we want to give special thanks to the Avant Family Endow Lecture Fund for sponsoring this lecture. Steve Abond, a 1965 architecture graduate, and his daughter, Linda Abond Freshman, a 2007 Penn graduate in political science and Latin American studies, have generously contributed to this initiative. We extend our gratitude to the Abond family, especially to Steve and Linda for their invaluable support. Stephen Hall brings us color, light, and time to elucidate philosophical positions in the early works of Stephen Hall Architects and making connections with the firm's more recent residential projects in Finland, Turkey, and Rome. This lecture will detail the new SHA Designed Student Performing Arts Center for the University of Pennsylvania. The building, which broke ground this fall, is characterized by three suspended trapezoid floating above the ground, echoing the dynamic movements of the performers. Sited along Whitland Walk and artist Jenny Holzer's text-based sculpture celebrating the history of women at Penn, the new center will frame a vibrant gateway at the northeast corner of campus. And when will it complete? It says on the sign for the 2nd of June, 2026. OK, very precise. <laughs> and I was going to say, someone like Stephen Hall needs no introduction, definitely not a UPenn. But I think students might also want to know that after he attended the University of Washington, um, Stephen pursued architecture studies in Rome first, and this I didn't know, um, and then joined the Architecture Associate Association, the AA, in London in 1976. Upon returning to the United States the year after, he established Stephen Hall Architects in New York City. Hall has been honored by some of the most prestigious awards for architecture. In 1998, the Alvar Aalto Meadow, in 2002, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture. In 2012, the AIA Gold Medal. And in 2014, the Premium Imperial Prize for Architecture, an amazing honor, presented by the Imperial Family of Japan on behalf of the Japan Art Association. As one of the most significant architects of our era, Stephen Hall has garnered critical acclaim for his exceptional manipulation of light, form, and phenomenolo phenomenology, fusing poetic sensitivity with the disciplined focus on materiality and spatial depth. Hall's architecture has been praised by Frampton for achieving a phenom phenomenal transparency that transcends mere functionalism. In an age where clients often demand insta Instagrammable design, Instagrammable moments, how many times have we heard that as designers uh, interfacing with clients today? Hall's work resists that superficial superficiality of social media-driven aesthetics, preserving a deeply meaningful, introspective approach to space and environment. And that's something I personally really appreciate. His architecture engages users in profound, resonant experiences that connect with context on a personal and emotional level, embodying a rare commitment to authenticity over spectacle. Now, please help me welcome Stephen.
Thank you. Well, I couldn't sleep last night, and uh, I thought, I can't start this talk without saying something. And I thought, we are living in the absurd, the Kafkaesque moment. Soren Kierkegaard, in 1855, believed that the absurd is the essential part of life. Franz Kafka, in 1920, writing on the absurd, said, the human condition is well beyond tragic or depressed. It is absurd. But he had a, a sense of humor. Albert Camus, in 1959, wrote that hope and the absurd in the works of Franz Kafka, love isn't just a confrontation with the absurdity of the world. It is a refusal to be broken by it. Camus. I could give a whole lecture on Camus. I think he's a very important figure right now, especially. Anyway, one of the last, one of the sentences, he died in an automobile accident in 1960 in a crazy car. And that's another story. Benny, anyway, one of, one of the things that he said was, bravely face the absurd with a smile on your face. Tonight, I want to give a talk about the basic things in architecture. Oops, I already skipped a few. What happened here? This book, to me, was very important. In 1984, Merleau-Ponty, for me, was a way out of my... I was stuck as an architect. I was studying the rationalists, Aldo Rossi. Uh, you know, all, all the, the moment of postmodernism was thriving, and I wanted to find another way. And I... I found in this work the questions that architecture, you know, really connect to philosophy. And I really recommend this. It's a wonderful book. It's an, you know, it's an old book. And I read it in 1984. And that kind of changed my, my direction. And in 1994, I wrote with Alberto Perez Gomez and Johanny Polasma a kind of manifesto, Questions of Perception. Phenomenology of Architecture. And this was at that moment where deconstruction at the Museum of Modern Art was all the rage. It was, you know, in a way, pushing out postmodernism. Then everything was, you know, kinky forms and no relation to structure and actually no real attention to space and the way you move through space. So this was a kind of manifesto book. It's been translated into four languages now. And if you try to find it, it's out of print, it, it's, you know, I'm, so I'm very proud of this work that I didn't do it alone. I did it with Johanny Plasma and Alberto Perez Gomez. And I'm going to divide this talk in, in three categories. In, in questions of perception, there are 11 phenomenal zones. And I'm, it's, you know, I can give that talk, but I, that takes an hour. <laughs> so what I decided to do is I'm going to just take three of the zones, color, light, and time, three parts from the 11, and then situate some work uh, in a way not in thorough, but meaningfully to me, these were important works. So the first section is color. And the idea of color really you know, blossomed for me in the chapel of St. Ignatius, which, which opened in 1997 in my home state at Seattle, Washington. I was born in Bremerton. I'm from a hard, hard scrabble a home in Bremerton, Washington. And here, um, they invited me to do this chapel. And I had this idea. I'd studied St. Ignatius' work. And I, de I decided that the, the different programs, the daily procession of mass, the blessed sacrament, the choir, the altar, the gathering, the preparation, oh, this could be organized in seven different bottles of light in a stone box. That was my first concept sketch. And as it developed, I also I went, I made a pilgrimage to the Black Madonna and Manresa, and I, I learned about the spiritual exercises of the of the the, the, the very important part of Saint Ignatius' teaching, where there's this idea of a teacher and the student, and they talk to each other back and forth. So that back and forth, this idea brought me to this notion of complementary colors. If you look at a blue rectangle, and then you turn and look at a white wall, you see a yellow rectangle. If you look at a red rectangle, you turn and see a, you see a green. So this idea of complementary colors 
in the seven bottles. That became the concept, which related to the spiritual exercise. There you see a red lens and a green reflected color baffle. There you see the opposite of a, of a, 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 a purple baffle and an orange lens. And so this, this building, you know, in a way has a life because in Seattle the sun goes over it and it pulses with a different kind of light depending on the time of day. And it's a very simple rectangle, but the seven bottles of light then, you know, create the spaces and the different program are articulated inside. And every detail, the, the benches, the light fixtures, um, it was an incredible client and they were really... You know, and today it's wonderful to go there because it's in perfect condition. If you get to Seattle, you must visit it. It's open all the time, and and the people on on at, at the campus understand this weird architect's concept because on their website they even talk about the color field and the lens, the narthex green and the and lens is red. You know, the the, the blessed sacrament is orange and the and, and and the lens is purple. They understand. This idea. I always feel that, you know, an idea has to drive the design of a building. And I believe never to hide that from the client. Sometimes I'm fired because my idea is too weird. But other times they, they embrace the idea and they never let it go. The, the campus architect said, oh, it's too expensive. Let's just have three or four bottles of light, not seven bottles of light. And the campus ministry said, absolutely not. Stephen, there's seven days. The concept is seven bottles of light. So we're revealing the idea. And then also there's the life of the building. We, when there's a big reflecting pond, and we thought, ah, oh, ducks could have their nest there. Because on the campus, there's this problem. There's too many students. But if they're suspended in this little grassy pod, and they, in fact, had babies there, and inside, they come in and sit on the carpet of Manresa. That's... That's a, the story of the St. Ignatius uh, revelation on, at Manresa. And the carpet I made, uh, the ducks come inside and send, sit down on the water. In, in MIT, we have color that's related to the structure. This was a building that had to be for six, you know, 10 floors. That was the limit, the height limit. And we decided that the structure and, and the form of the building would be united in this kind of structural grid that would be an exoskeletal concrete structure. And within the building, you have 350 students and 10 different um, um, social spaces, lounges. And those become like sponge holes in the building. And that was the way it was made. Guy Nordenson was the engineer. <clears throat> so the engineering and the architecture were united. Uh, the structure is part of an expression that's central to the meaning. It was all precast in Canada and these big pieces with different layers of steel inside because of the different forces. And I thought, ah, I want to show the, 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 the color. I want color to be on the inside, the soffit, the jam, and the head. And I thought I wanted to show the student houses, the 10 different houses. And I met with the students several times. And then one time I, I showed them the color diagram and they said, we don't want to be identified from the outside. We don't want anybody to know where we are. So I went back to my office uh, kind of depressed and I found this diagram. And I think I, I missed it. There it is. I found this diagram of the steel rebar that Guy Nordenson produced where the red is bigger and heavier, and the green and blue is less. So I said, okay, we just make the color the rebar. So that's how it was built. And today, engineering students come and talk about it because they can see the forces. They, you know, if they saw the text, the rebar is where the, you know, the red is where the heavy forces are, the strain on the building. And the, the, the public spaces are like those sponge-like openings that are completely organic inside of this gridded system. Every, every student has nine windows operable. And we were just up there two weeks ago to visit. And there's my wife and Thibos and Eo. I have a four-year-old and an eight-year-old. And they were really happy to go inside. And the students were wonderful showing us the building. And that color idea then also has a different life 
because it's in front of a playing field, so you get that kind of wonderful night glow. Another building about color is the Maggie's Cancer Care Center. I was very honored to be chosen by Charles Jenks for one of the Maggie's Cancer Care Centers. And here, it was in the middle of London, and it was right next to a, 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 a listed building. And it was a very difficult pr process where most of the Maggie centers are out in the open. And it was near a church, a very ancient cathedral. In fact, so old that uh, St. Bartholomew's was before musical staff notation, and they had what they call noom notation by the monks. <clears throat> they were colored diagrams. And noom means breath of life. So I made this diagram about before the staff notation. And I thought about the building itself somehow making a connection to music because the site was about music. And so the outside of the building is these noom notations. The, the inner layer is a kind of a concrete frame that's exposed, and the interior is all natural bamboo. It's all organic materials in the building, so it's very comforting and, 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 and a soothing place for people. And there you see the beginning of 13th century noom notation, those colors, and I got very excited about that, and I made a whole diagram. Oh, Vera figured out how to do this with the steel staff of the windows. That was very difficult. and. Uh, so we discovered that we could make, instead of stained glass, we could make a, a film but in this uh, material called Ocalux between the inner and the outer layer. And that became a, a super wonderful material. In fact, I think they produce it now. We invented it for this project. Ocalux is super insulating material made in Germany. And you can see the color becomes a kind of like a Mark Rothko, a, faded, a kind of faded color. And there's the listed building that we're building next to. And the building has this kind of wonderful glow at night where it glows from the inside out and glowing at day from the outside in. And you rise up to the top and it's a garden at the very top. And uh, it's a wonderful building, my only building in London, but it's, it's really well kept. Light. I'm always ask, what's your favorite material? I said, my favorite material is light. And I guess the manifesto of a building that shows that would be the Chiasmo building that opened 25 years ago. There's some views of it, and it's all been restored. That was the first sketch that was made in a hotel looking down when I, I thought about the intertwining. And I was reading Merleau-Ponty, the last book he wrote, in fact, the visible and the invisible. And there's a, there's a chapter called The Intertwining. So I was in the middle of, one of the things I think as an architect who teaches, I love to teach and talk about how philosophy and art, you know, influence what you're doing. But if you're doing design process at the same time you're reading these texts, that's how you get it to work. You can't just read the book as a separate thing. You need to be working on something so and just read some, you know, a few pages and this back and forth that happens. Anyway, that's, that's how I got this idea for the building. I was reading Merleau-Ponty's last text. And there it is in the center of Helsinki, all those wonderful Finlandia Hall there, the idea of the bay and the water, Tolon Nautil Bay coming right up to the building, intertwining landscape and architecture. But this is very important, you see, because I'm reading the last text that he wrote, and he died tragically, I think, at 63 years old. And this talks about the, 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 the interlocking of the body. The, the, as he, in, inside, there's a, the one hand holding the other hand, like an intertwining, like a chiasma. So I, when I entered the competition, I wrote chiasma. Here's the competition drawings. There was, it was an on, anonymous competition, 415 entries. And, and we wrote the word, the, we had to write a co, code word. So I wrote chiasma, which was C-H-I-A-S. And at the end, Finnish doesn't have a C-H. So they gave it a K and they named the building over the Merleau-Ponty word chiasma. Anyway, these, these, these are, it was done in four boards. And I had a mixture of the watercolors and the computer drawings. This was 1993, 
and we had one computer. And I, I had to work on it because I changed the design right late in the competition. I had one computer, so we had to work on it 24 hours, eight hour shifts, eight, 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 everybody. The machine never stopped and we turned it in. And then it took two months for them to decide. And uh, these, these are the actual drawings that we won the competition with. You see the watercolors are mixed with the computer drawings. And the idea of the diagram, the building catches light. It's like a catcher's mitt. The, the Helsinki sun is very low. So being, being a, a curved, curved a, a channel glass wall, it brings light in. And there's 21 galleries. And when we had the opening uh, moment, well, that's another story, but when we had the groundbreaking, the, there was, there's Johanny Palazma, Vesa Honkin, and me. The, the, this wonderful Keo Reita laid a, a series of flames out in the snow, marking the whole, you know, the whole geometry of the building and did a dance performance on the site. Finland is a place where they love architecture. It's a wonderful place. And uh, there's watercolors from the original and how it is you know, today. Watercolors from the original and how it is today. That's the bow tie skylights. I won't go into it in detail, but light needs to penetrate every gallery. So I had some series of galleries in the back. So I did this kind of opening up the, the roof with a bow tie skylight that cuts open the roof and brings that light down inside. And the central stair has a wonderful, what we call the pasta stair. Pretty nice place. I thought they were really not gonna have trouble building that, but they loved building it. They, they, they saw the drawings, they said, this is a challenge. They were Austrobothnians, and they worked. I mean, the, they broke ground on January 6th in the snow, and they, they just they worked all the time. It was an amazing experience to see them. And the building is totally restored. If you go there, if you're ever in Helsinki, in the front of the building, it has the name, my name, when I was born. It's like they treat the architect like an artist. At Columbia University, when I did a building there, they wouldn't let me put my name on the building. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen here at University of Pennsylvania. But in Finland, they totally respect architects. And uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to, to visit the building. And it's all about light. This is a building just finished two years ago. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Also a building about light. You can see the original building down here. It's a, it's a brick box. It's a little brick box. This is the small part. Part of the basement. It's a tiny little brick box. No windows. Plastic skylights that were turned yellow. So we need to replace it. Ben Winter gave the money. The Winter uh, Visual Arts Center. And it's, it's at the other end of campus. Um, and this is, a, you know, this is a beautiful campus. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. With very original... Uh, buildings. That's Old Main. Not a neoclassical building, somewhat original architect. And uh, before I got the commission, I made these sketches. I talked about Franklin and Marshall. Franklin, who had this idea to fly his kite in the rain and find out about electricity when the rain and the lightning hit his kite. And Marshall, who was a lawyer, the heavy. So I had this idea of the heavy and the light. And then the second idea was that the trees, the, the, the great trees on the campus, would in, in, impose their root ball geometries on the building and shape it. And here's a, here's a video. I hope this thing plays. We just made this um, It's very important to us that people look at the building, look through the building, now we're open to our neighbors. So this is an opening to the world for Franklin and Marshall. And with this magnificent forest around us, these hundred year old trees, it really helps keep our students immersed in nature, even when they're indoors. I'm looking at a tree behind you right now, which is just splendid. Everywhere you look, I see a tree trunk. Here, I see a tree trunk. Everywhere I look, I see the tree. My ability to go from the roots of the tree to, to its canopy through the building, or to always be turning into a direction that situates me from looking south, then looking north, then looking south again, is allowing me to contextualize my natural environment in an embodied way, which I think is the really tricky thing to describe to, about this building because 
can't see it, you can't photograph it. It's temporal and it's sequential and it goes from the beginning of the staircases all the way to the top where you have the final opening in the balcony. That is a kind of contextualism that is profound and philosophical. Hello, good to see you, good to see you. Oh my God. One of the things that I felt when I came here, when I looked at this building and I saw these octagonal verticals, four of them, and the way that this building is made, it's very inventive. I felt free when I looked at this building. And Ben Winter, the great donor client, wanted a piece of modern architecture for the art school. Lux and Lex, light and law. So my first sketch is the idea of Benjamin Franklin with his kite getting electricity on the string and the key and some kite-like form floating and then a heavy bass, so light and heavy. These are amazing old trees, some hundreds of years old and huge trees. And I said, this building should defer to these gigantic trees. And I made this sketch where the root balls of these giant arboreal trees shape this building. So it would be concave around the whole architecture. And then now the clarity of the heavy and the light had a geometry. The actual structure is like a box kite. It's a brachiating form that wanders through the trees. All the trees on the side are preserved. So the concept is actually pragmatically saving all the trees. So one of the things about the heavy and the light, the heavy base, these are concrete walls, solid, right? They're supporting the whole building. So all the heavy work, the, the sculpture and heavy materials is located here. And then that's a gallery. Is that still used as a gallery? Still used as a gallery? So that's still a gallery. That's interesting. I'll tell you something about being an architect. You come back after three years, yeah. they don't use the building the way you thought they were going to use it. So that's a gallery and this is the shop. So <laughs> success. So I want to go to the different rooms and see how they're being used. So, Would you like to see us? Yeah, let's, let's go up. An architect makes a building, but how is it being used? How do you guys use it? Do you like it? Uh, the skylight and the space and the activity that goes on, it's really nice to run into the students, you know, and see what they're doing, the youthful energy around, and we've got quite a large amount of time here. Yeah, you can tell it's lived in. Right. It's, this looks like an apartment. Yeah. 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 It's very feels nice. Yeah. So who, what music, do you, do you compose the music? Yeah. Can, can we hear something? Yeah. I don't know she, because my life depends on every day. Every hour, every day. I don't even remember this room, by the way. I'm going to look at my drawings, and I think this is supposed to be a storage room for the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> I really love the fact that this is very used, you know. When you just open the building, these rooms are empty. And you wonder, what's going to go on in there? Now you don't wonder what's going on. Look at all that paint. Look at the empty containers. Look at the printing. You can feel the energy of somebody creating something in here. Fantastic. I am a business and Spanish major here. So I have no connection to art or have not taken any art classes actually, but I find this place to be really beautiful and really nice, whether it's in the daytime with all the natural light, but also it provides like a isolation that I don't get anywhere else on campus. And so whether it's a classroom, the atrium, or just like a regular conference room, it's really nice to just do work and kind of chill with my friends. One of the really nice features of this building is when you walk in, it doesn't feel like there's any hallways. All of the space is usable. So even when you're transitioning between rooms, the space that you're in just adjoins to all the classrooms and lets you go between, but there's also spaces to sit and hang out and talk. A lot of professors like to leave the doors to the classrooms open, all of them are really large and they like turn on these axes so that they don't feel really like a door, they feel more like a movable wall. And you feel a lot more connected with the people in the other classes, even though you're not in these classes together, you're all learning together. 
even though we have a lot of rooms here, it doesn't have hallways. It has this sort of commons area and then big pivot doors that open onto the commons area. And here you can see the, the real idea of the roof. The box kite structure is in the walls and then the roof is also made out of the same magnetic induction bent pipes. And then the Amish craftsmen laid in all the roof beams and they did it in like a week and a half. It was amazing. So the entire top of the building is Amish built. So this building is rather light. See, downstairs, if I go knocking on a wall, it's heavy. This is wood. There's a truss in there. That's a wood wall. And in every, every room in this building, there's natural ventilation and natural light. Obviously the walls, they're glass and they're translucent. And so it feels like only this thin veil of separation between you and the outside. But the windows set into them, because they're so large, you can like look outside and you can feel like the calmness of the park. You have this idea that the, the building's gonna respond to these root balls. Now, how are you gonna do this? You can't afford curved glass, but if you use glass structural plank, you can go around the corner. These are facets, these are square. There's no curved glass in this building. It's too expensive. But what's interesting about this is it's the super insulated wall with Okaluk, which is like polar bear hair, hollow. It's very, very ecological. And I gotta say, at night, it is absolutely gorgeous. It glows and it simply illuminates this whole corner of the neighborhood. So what we intended this space for was a place for self-expression and self-discovery. But I think it's actually fulfilling an even higher function, which is that it actually works to give us a place for fun, for play, and also really a place for hope, for aspiration. I'm very glad that we have this building that allows for higher thinking and to allow us to rise out of the morass of everything that's difficult and aspire. They told me that the, there's an increase in desire for enrollment in the art program there. So it's, the building is actually drawing, drawing students. This is another building that we just finished in 2022, the Rubenstein Commons the Institute for Advanced Studies. It's where Einstein did his last work. 1955, Fold Hall, there was a competition. And my, my competition drawings showed this notion, again, a little bit like the, the notion of phenomenology intertwining the nature, the mathematics, the humanity, the art. And I made this sketch that you could walk through the whole building, you know, from one end to the other, just as a passage. And there would be water gardens in four different places. And then I made that diagram. This is during the competition, this notion of intertwining and meshing. But here, there's a curvilinear aspect. And you can see there's the building. And Fold Hall is in the center. That's where Einstein's last office was. And the building is on the right. The modern buildings that they built on the campus, they were all flat roofs. Let's say conceit. And we came to this idea of something much more bulbous, much more letting in the light. And I made these diagrams about how light could enter this space in different ways, different ways that light could enter. This is during the competition before we won. And I thought about Einstein's work and the notion of curve and the idea of a space curve. It's a curve in 3D space between two planes, like a baseball, the way a baseball jacket works. So that's a space curve. So I thought, ah, that's kind of a conceptual strategy. And the, the director of the museum loved my thoughts. He said, ah, those bulbous roofs are like places for thought balloons. All of our other buildings have these flat roofs, but these are places for our thought balloons. And anyway, we beat a number of people, Rem Koolhaas was one of them, and he was very angry afterwards. 
anyway, it opened just a few years ago, two years ago, and uh, you can see the space curves. These are the lines with the space curve. Up above, that's a space curve, that's a space curve, that's a space curve, and that whole space you know, bolts up, and that's, that's, the, that's where the light comes in. So, and, th and then also you walk through it. You walk from one end, there's Fould Hall. That's Einstein's last office at the end. You see the tower sticking up. So it's right on axis. But these beautiful spaces of light on the inside. And the, 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 the scientists here, they don't like whiteboards. They don't like the magic markers. They want chalkboards. I said, great. So then I got this giant pieces of slate and I made almost all the walls chalkboards all, all the way around. We did the furnishing, the light fixtures, all the details. Great client. In fact, here's, this is a space curved light where the two circles, when they connect, they're making a space, that geometry is a space curve. This is for the IAS, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. It's a space curve light fixture, and here's how we make them. Anyway, I got the approval of certain people that were very important. Uh, Corb came to meet Einstein on this site, and I made a special meeting, so they approved of the project. And the water gardens are now finally getting their foliage, and it's it's in use. I'm not going to show this in detail. Just it's, this section is about light, and one of the things about light is the original Kennedy Center by Edward Durrell Stone. 1972, has almost no natural light. And the people who work inside there, they have, they're in those offices behind that marble wall, they don't have natural light, and they have simulators that simulate daylight and the change so they don't go crazy during the day. Anyway, we said, in our extension, every space will have natural light. And that's all I'm, I'm not gonna show the concept and everything, it would take too long, but every space in our expansion has natural light. There's the you know, the rehearsal halls with the, with, the, with the acoustic concrete and the natural light and the main entrance lobby with the natural light coming down. And it's a great public space for everyone and they use it really wonderfully and they're, they're very happy with it. Time, okay. Architecture for me takes eight years, from, usually from the first sketch until it opens. That's my average. Right? So four years is nothing. Forget about it. Right? It's going to be over. Four years. Eight years. That's my average. And I'm, I'm actually very happy to, to, to report some strangeness in that regard. For example, a building that took 15 years to realize. The, the Newt Hamsen in uh, Hamaroy, Norway, where... It's above the Arctic Circle, and I was working on that Chiasma Museum in Helsinki, and they said, we heard that you have no, my grandfather was born in Tunsberg, Norway. We heard that you have Norwegian blood. We want to make a mu museum for Newt Homsen. So I read all of Newt Homsen's, I, I read Hunger when I was in high school, by the way, but I read all of his books, Mysteries, and the wonderful, crazy stream of consciousness writing of Newt, Newt Homsen. And I made these sketches in 1994. Look. 9, 12, 94, and I, and I had this idea that the building as a body, as a battleground of invisible forces, the spine elevator, uh, the, the, the different, the, 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 the women with sleeves rolled up polishing yellow glass, number four. Anyway, the whole building is, is, is a way a parallel to the writing of Newt Homsen. And it was really an interesting project. I got a first PA award. This, this model is in the Museum of Modern Art, but the project went dead. Why? Because they were totally rejected my project. They, they, it was too radical. 
It was in newspapers for months, in my years. I mean, almost, this is like 19, this is two years after I designed it. It's still in the newspaper. In fact, they made a bar, uh, they delivered beer out of a model of it in some, somebody's bar. And, and everybody was making fun of the building. And one interesting thing happened. A, 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 a teacher went, told her students to go out into the landscape and draw vernacular architecture. And they all came back with pictures of the new Hampson building because it was in the newspapers. And that was what, their, their mind, what was in their minds. Then, magically, eight, nine years later, a man from Narvik, farther north than Hamaroy, ha came and said, I'm going to go to the government and get this building built. It's important. Newt Homsen was an important figure, probably the most important figure in literature in all of Norwegian history. We're going to get this built. And he went and he got the funds. That, but then they said, it has to open on Newt Homsen's, I think it was 150th anniversary. So we had to build the building after waiting 14 years. We had to build a building in 14 months. So this this went on, they, again, they did shifts, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours. They, the, the sun goes down in, in Hamroy in December and doesn't come up again until February. It's very far north. Anyway, the building opened with a big fanfare. Um, 6,000 people were there. It's one of the things that, uh, that achieved, the way we got it through, it's a long story, but I added a community center building. So this is the vertical building, the building of invisible forces of the body. And then the community center is just a horizontal with a green roof. So that, that helped get the building through um, and, and become a community center, be active in many different ways. It's concrete uh, exposed tube. So the structure is the wall, is this, there's no columns. There's just the column of the spine elevator down the middle. And the way the light comes in, also is activated all the time because of the low angle of the sun up there. And every year, at the, about this time, around December 15th or 17th, they send me the last sunlight in the building, and then they, and then they don't get the sunlight. It just glows on the horizon, the pink snow, until February. And that's the light ricocheting off the brass um, cage around the spine elevator in the middle. And here comes, I think this is the last sun. That's it. And probably that was about five years ago. I'm waiting for it. I, I should send them an email. That, Please send me the last strip of sun um, this December. So this building, talking about time again, this building took 17 years to realize. Right? I don't know what time you started architecture, maybe 17 years ago, how old you were. But imagine that if you're an architect, you've got to have patience, time, patience, 17 years. We made a competition in 2006, and uh, we were, it was a block in the Helsinki. The Kiasma building is, is right over here. There's called a block. So it was a competition. There were five invited architects. And I, I thought, God, it's really hard. What are you going to do inside the block? And I thought, you've got to make space somehow. You've got to make the building shape the void space. So given block, 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 block. And I just made that sketch. And I said, these would be public spaces, A, B, and C, void space. I'm not like, you know, usually making a serpentine building. But in this case, it seemed to work. Uh, as, a, as a strategy, and then it died. What happened was, the, in 2008, the economic collapse. Everything went into the drawers, so it was over. And then it kept getting alive. This is 2008. There were this, they would sell the rights to build a building to one developer, and they'd come and say, hey, come to Helsinki. We gotta. Anyway, I kept going to Helsinki. It kept coming alive and then dying again. So it was kind of born and dying. And then this was 2016. Those guys, they bought the rights, but and then it died again. But then uh, Nguyen Bao, a very young, incredibly idealistic developer, bought the rights to build the building and said, we're going to build it exactly all your details. We want you involved all the way through. And they did it. They did an incredible job. And here's a little video from a month ago. Here we are in Helsinki 
at the opening of the Meander Housing, a competition we won 17 years ago with the idea of a meandering form that shapes space because the site is, is inside of a block. There's a, a rectangular building boxing the site in. So by the simple shape of a meandering line, all the apartments are different and they gradually rise to face the sea. There's some really economical apartments in this building. So it's a bit of a social project as well. The original project in the competition 17 years ago had 74 units. They added, and they have 119 units. We're standing, standing in the end unit that cantilevers over the arrival, the parking arrival, and 54 people lined up to buy this. It was one of the most popular. And out of the 117 apartments here, 100 are already sold. The other thing that we developed since the competition win was a membrane, the idea of a ship in a bottle. So there's a signal of thin glass that can be moved. If you can have a kind of solarium in the wintertime or open it completely in the summer. And the building is divided by its structure. All the structure is concrete and it divides the different apartments. And when we get down to the base, it elevates the building and you can see these concrete walls, that's the structure express. And there's a kind of musical score-like aspect to that. And you can see that in the gardens with these little concrete walls that articulate the organization of this larger <laughs> void space that's the consequence of the original concept. And that's the idea of the structure. That was early on, even in the competition. It's, it's good to get insulation from one apartment to another, but at seven meters, it's a good space to also shut this part of the building. It's the whole river. It's the whole river that goes through this urban area. It's very rapid. A small, small construction structure. But I always think of it like, almost like a musical score. It's running through this rather expressionistic curve, but then it, can, it gets very, very pragmatic. You know, a building is, uh, quite pragmatic, and what I like about it is there's expensive apartments at the top, but enormously cheap, little tiny apartments. So it has a kind of social mix. And it was really exciting at the opening of the 12th of September that out of 117 apartments, 100 were already sold at the opening of this building. So there's some sections that has some parking underneath, and it changes in section. And they did some nice work in the landscape. It's like a ship in the bottle with that thin um, membrane that you can move around and then inside the finish wood. And un underneath is a kind of sky blue, New England blue sky feeling of the, and even, uh, we did everything. We did the door handles, light fixtures, even the dog dish, meander water dish for the dog. And this is a project that also, I, it wasn't a competition, it, they, it was an inv invitation in 2006, and that's going on now, so that means this project is 18 years <clears throat> and, and still going. Okay, so have patience, you know, as, if you're a young architect, it doesn't happen overnight. That was the sketch I made in 2006. It was very idealistic, there was nothing there. It's in Akpuk, near this incredible site of Melitos, wonderful historic first gridded city in Greek history. And I, I had the idea of a, a dense pack and save the natural landscape and, and organize it in the three parts. And that was the first sketch of 12606 made on the dense pack islands, maximized natural landscape, zero ecolog <coughs> ecological footprint, geothermally heated and cooled solar panels on the roofs, and here's a little video that we just made. We were just there a month ago. For me, architecture is always about a site, a place, a special quality, the climate, the circumstance. So every project is unique. And I came here 17 years ago, and we went to visit Menetos, the ancient, amazing Greek city, the first written city in Western civilization, which gave the idea of making dense pack and preserving the natural landscape for the whole of this community. And it's divided into three types. We have on the ground, which is the courtyard villas, each one with their own pool and parking spaces. Under the ground, which are the townhouses, 
all of their private pools. And over the ground, which is the precinct with a public square and a common building. The thing about the precinct, it becomes a public place for the entire community. And there is a public square, restaurant, cafe, the natural light, the natural ventilation, the spatial sequence, they're all unique. And the entire project has really great intimate human scale because nothing is higher than two levels, except for this great space at the top. We call it the sculptural space of light. It can be thought of as a music space, a gambling space, but it's a community space that everyone can use. There are three light monitors for the three times in the year, summer solstice, winter solstice, and spring equinox. Again, the idea of three, which is in this project, which bring a kind of social dimension to the whole community. It also brings up the question from Paul Logan's famous 1897 painting, who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? The other thing I think which is so important is every villa here has a view of the GNC, of the horizon, which is spectacular here. And Kennedy had this famous thing that he said, the blood has the same soul content as the sea. And therefore, we have this idea that everything returns to the sea. That's from two days ago, oh, and it's going on. So I'm, I'm planning to come back here and give a one hour lecture on this building. And I'm just putting it in color, light, and time because I'm just gonna give you a preview Right, and I want to tell the whole story when I come back, and I'm going to show. Where's the video? The video. This is a very important site, Chestnut, and 33rd Street, an incredibly important site, and we built a number of models, I mean, maybe 50 different models of this project, and and, and it moved from. Uh, but I have a video. I think where is the video? This is a concept that we're. We're, we're at, which is the kind of performative trapezoids that are suspended, kind of floating above, inviting you in, making a public space below, but giving basic places for people to practice. And that's the, the main force to not just have a performing art space, but to have all these practice rooms and, and dancing, not to sit on the ground, is up. Ah, look. So when I come back, I'm going to show you an hour lecture. All these different schemes have plants and sections and lots of watercolors. And that'll be like an educational video about how hard it is to do. This is not an easy site. One of the problems that we found is we wanted to spread out and form a landscape space. But then there was this incredible bunch of, of, of utility lines that run through the site that they didn't tell us about until very long. And such an important site, you know, Woodland Walk, that's like a social place, you know? I mean, I love those benches. I was been read, I've read every one of those quotes, and I think it's a very important site on any campus, and, and, and a kind of really a political, wonderful political line. But what I love about this also is it connects our site to this great Frank Furness Hall, and then That was my ideal in my life, but I went to the, I was a student and I had not gone to graduate school. By the way, I never went to graduate school at the end of it. I got accepted at Harvard and Yale and MIT, and I came here to Philadelphia and I asked to, if I could work for Connie. I said, I've saved up my, you know, my tuition and I want to work for free. And the guy there, I think his name was James Foote, he said, when Lou gets back, I'm sure it's going to be fine. And he never came back. That was, he died in 19, uh, March 1974. And that was, and I was there, and uh, my interview was December 18th, 1973. Anyway, so that to me was a change of my life. And I went to the AA, and that's a whole other story. But when I, I, I'd like to tell the whole story of what this project means to me in detail. And I can't, uh, because this lecture is about color, light, and time, and I'm running out of time. And I want questions, you know, if we, you know, that's fun. And it's a great space. We tested it in so many models, great acoustics. 
And all, during this, we've, we work with everybody on all these teams. And I, I tried to push for this. I have a, a, a bunch of diagrams that show how many different ways you can make theater in the round and move the seats all around. But I realized that they really want, Chris Gruitz and the people from, from the various committees really wanted a, a real hall like Broadway, a full fly tower, an orchestra pit, everything you have, all the, you know, the basics. It's not uh, like, well, it's, I'll, I'll do that in the other lecture. And these are just some views. We're doing our details. They're letting us do all the steel of the structures exposed. It's very lightweight. You can see in at the ground, we're being very careful about birds. No birds uh, smashing against the glass like they do at the dormitory at Lander. Uh, no, uh, louder. What is it called? Loud, louder. Anyway, they, they have a bird. And then it's, you know, the details inside. So just to close, I want to say the, I'm working for a net zero on our archive building in Rhinebeck, which has one geothermal well, 500 feet deep, that heat and cool 3,000 square feet. And the building was based on the idea of brachiating form, which means it goes through the trees. It's only 18 feet wide. And that is all the models and ar uh, archiving all of my material. And over the years, all my watercolor sketches. And it's a, it's a study center, and it's part of a 5013C, and it has a 30-acre natural landscape. That was going to be a five-house subdivision, and instead we made a, 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 a natural a preserve and, and, and build one single building on it. So Color, Light, and Time is a book. Um, I think it's out of print now that I wrote with Sanford Quinter and Jordi Safontria. And um, one of the things at the end of the book, I thought I knew what time was. So I said, okay, yeah. And then after, you know, what's happening when you write a book, you can go back and rethink it, but you can't quite, you know, change it. And I said, there were seven types of time in architecture. Diurnal time, the everyday. Seasonal time, we have to think about. The winter, how does it look in winter? Linear time, like the Greeks, you know, the, the architecture is forever. You know, a cyclic idea of architecture local site time, the, the nature of the site, and what is it? Bergson talked about time as duration. But what about the duration of the construction? If the construction takes eight years, which happened to me in, in, in China a few times, experiential time, and then also Bergson's idea of the notion of time as duration. And I thought, ah, yeah, seven types of time. But then afterwards, I left out what Lou Kahn said was one of the most important things, the immeasurable, the immeasurable sense. And so then I, I only have one edition of this book where I scratch out and I write down the part that I left out. So there's eight types of time. Thank you. I can. Well, open for questions now. There's a question. Yeah, you have to have a microphone. Hello. Um, thank you so much for coming and for sharing your work. Um, I, um, I read that you worked for Lawrence Halperin and yes. studied with Richard Haig before you went to the AA. Yes. And I'm wondering if you can talk about um, the influence of landscape architecture, and especially that time in the 70s with Halperin um, on your education. Thank you for asking that. You know, I was going to dedicate this talk to Richard Haig. He was such an amazing teacher. And if you Google his name, there's a beautiful little video of him at 93 years old telling what he's working on. It's amazing. It was an amazing teacher. And he, he talks about, in that video, he talks about Ian McCarg, who was here in Philadelphia. So, yeah, he inspired me very, very much. So when I went to San Francisco, I couldn't find any architects worthy. Uh, the Moreland and Turnbull were not hiring. I thought, oh, here comes this really talented guy from Seattle. I'm going to just show him my portfolio. But I didn't calculate that they weren't hiring at the time. So I got to San Francisco, and I had to work for some not-so-good firms. And I finally got in to work for Lawrence Halperin. 
And that was great because he really made ideas in landscape. You know, he, he really made, for me, it was like a great experience. And that I carried that through all my work. And in a certain sense, I think landscape architecture is one of the most important fields now than ever because we really need to preserve our natural landscapes. We need to think about them. We need to think about how they work as kind of green lungs in the city in every, every possible way. So on our project, uh, Ed Hollander, my old friend, is doing the landscape. I, I talked to Lori Olin about it. I wish I did do a project with Richard Haig. I, I was in the competition for the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. We didn't win, but I went back to Seattle, and uh, Richard and I did the, the landscape for the, for the competition. He was an amazing, amazing character, uh, just a Zen person, I mean. And, and there's a new book uh, that came out in 2014 by Mark Tribe and others on the work of Richard Hag, uh, Gaswork Park. So that, that's my, you know, that between Richard Hag and Oster Zarina, where I studied in Rome, and Hermann Punt, who wrote Schinkel's Berlin, that's my beginning. So even though I'm in a kind of Pacific Northwest, you know, bad way off corner in the, in the, in the United States, it was a great place to, to study and learn. Thank you for asking about landscape. Thank you, Mr. Hall, um, for such an impressive lecture. And your work has deeply moved me. Uh, and meeting you today is truly an honor. And as an architecture student, your MIT's Mason Hall was an influential study for me. And also as a Chinese student, um, I've been especially drawn to your linked hybrid complex in Beijing, and I see a fascinating continuity in architecture language between those two projects. Um, yeah, so my question is, as an architect working across different urban contexts, pol politics, and culture landscape, how do you approach uh, expressing your architecture vision in each unique setting? And what are the key principles that guide your design process while navigating this varied environments? I try, you know, to start each project from, from scratch with the idea of the site, the circumstance, certainly the client, the, the culture, the life. You know, I mean, it, it, to me, the, 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 the Kiasma building could only be done in Helsinki. I think my first project in China was the Nanjing Museum. And the Nanjing Museum, I, I was studying Chinese perspective, the idea of no vanishing points, the idea of parallel perspective. And the building is made, you know, gardens of parallel perspective. And the whole lower level is recycled brick hutongs that were being torn down in Nanjing. And I made the gardens, the water gardens, and the, all in recycled hutong bricks. And, and the building is formed in gigantic bamboo. So concrete was formed, the, the structural form was lined with these giant bamboo. And it's, it's very, you know, animated building. And yeah, someone else did that bamboo form concrete. Uh, I think I did it first. Anyway, but I think you, it, it comes from trying, really trying to connect to a place, you know, trying to make a connection. And sometimes it's more successful than others. And, uh, but that's definitely an effort, not to carry a style from one, from one site to the next, but to try to make something fresh, which means it's more work, of course. That's why we, you know, economically we barely survive as an office, you know, right? And people say, why can't you raise my salary? And I say, wait, wait a minute. We're not doing corporate work. We're not doing any of those. We got to, you know, we're doing several schemes for every project. Anyway, it's, a, it's the, the love of architecture to try to make a fresh and original piece each each time, and, and I, I love it, and I'm never going to give it up, never going to retire. I don't know why it said that. But. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's incredible to see the work. It's incredible to see the trajectory and the ideas. Um, I've been a huge fan of your work since I saw St. Ignatius um, for the first time. It was amazing. It, hearing, seeing it all put together tonight, um, 
I would love to hear your reflection on the trajectory of history and the trajectory of modernism, especially. Of what? Of Modernism. <clacht> Specifically, Le Corbusier and Alvar Alto. Because uh, there's several places where it's more than a quote. It's a very deep homage. And I'm just wondering if you could, if you could give us some insight on that. I, 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 I visited all of Alto's work, you know, and I, I'm always amazed at how inventive. There's some rep repetition. There is some repetition, but the, the invention and the, 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 the love of detail and space and light in Alto's work needs to be experienced. You have to go to Finland, and there's so many buildings to visit. It's really, a, actually, I went in 1991. Um, I, I was invited to the Alto Symposium, which it happens every two years. And Kenneth Frampton, I, the first time I was invited, two years before that, I, I said I was too busy. And Kenneth Frampton told me, you must go. It will change your life. And I did. I went. And I went on this voyage up these lakes, up to the Uvascula, where the Alto Museum is. But on the way, we stopped at the weekend house of Alvar Alto. And Mrs. Alto was still alive. His last wife was still alive. She you know, gave everybody some you know, hors d'oeuvres and wine. And we're walking around this beautiful you know, experimental weekend house on the edge of the lake. And I said, you know, I said to her, I said, no, I, I heard he was painting to the end. Is there, is there anything? She says, oh, you want to see? Go up that ladder, and you'll see the last painting he was working on. And I went up this kind of stair ladder, and there, a little canvas, green, very abstract, uh, with oils, was the last painting that Alto was working on. And I think, for me, it's the synthesis of the arts that bring out the point in time of a culture. It isn't just architecture. It's art, it's music, it's poetry, sculpture. And I think, when I think about modern, I don't know what that means. I think we always move into the future. We have to make things that are about the future. Because that's optimistic, you know, for a younger generation to see something they never saw before. You know, the, the campus, talk about the tra trajectory, okay? The campus at Franklin and Marshall, the last building they built before my building was a Robert Stern dormitory with neoclassical columns and a pediment. And they hated it. The trustees and the students. So one of the reasons we got at the other end of the campus to make a modern work is they hated this retro, you know, pseudo-historical thing. So I think it has to do with hope, the idea that we're moving, we have new things to, to, to feel, new energies. And I mean, my, my, I have an eight-year-old EO, Helene Hall, and she's completely, you know, modern in her mind. You should see her drawings. I mean, so, yeah. I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I think it's an ongoing project. It's just like life going on, right, going forward. Thank you. Um, I can see phenomenology uh, just goes through all your projects. Um, I think phenomenology for me is more like uh, uh, the underlying logic that we per process the world or we how we perceive it, um, and it's more abstract. But when we do architecture, I feel um, architecture is about space, uh, wall, um, ceiling, door, windows. Those things are really concrete, and I so how. Did you just transform this underlying logic, the phenomenology, into the phenomena? Um, how to process that, and what experience uh, and practices help you to do, do it? That's a good question. And in questions of perception, that's what the book is about. It's about exactly that. And in there, I even say, I quote Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein said, there's no such thing as phenomenology. There are indeed phenomenological questions, which is interesting, right? So the idea of perspectival space, the idea of the, un, you know, the, 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 the unfolding of space as we move through a building, that one space opens up in another space, another space, another space, or the idea, you know, all these ideas, and then 
those are in 11 phenomenal zones. So yeah, that's a great question because that's what that whole book that um, Johanny Palazma and Alberto Perez and I wrote. Um, and I, I think it's still valid. I mean, I, you know, when, when I started out, I, I wrote a book called Anchoring. I said, every site and circumstance must have the unique project, period. I'm not going to do what Richard Meyer did, which is a language, or my old friend Zaha Hadid, which was a kind of calligraphic language. I want to do something that's specific to the site and circumstance. But I, then I thought to myself, you know what, that's not the whole picture. There's got to be more to it. So that's when I wrote with Palasma and the questions of perception with 11 phenomenal zones. So those are the universals. You know, color, light, time. Those are universals. And if you can think about those in a creative way, I think you're already doing it. You, you know, you're, you're, you're doing phenomenology. You're just making it, right? Reflecting color or the space or the light. So, yeah, it's a good question. Next, anything? Maybe there's one back there. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the fascinating lecture. And I also enjoyed our brief discussion outside the library before, especially in light of hearing about your experience um, interviewing for Khan's firm. So that, that was interesting to me. Um, I really enjoyed your uh, breakdown of the different types of time, starting with diurnal. And I think you touched on this a lot in uh, talking about all the projects in, um, in the lecture, but there's an even smaller breakdown of time that's the sort of just the procession through a space and the time that one the user experiences it and this is something that I think we all in school out of school have to think about and I know I've been thinking about it for a long time when I was an undergraduate student I was working on a project that was about a quarter of a mile long and it was about vanishing points and the lack thereof and the ways that we can craft experiences that way and I looked particularly at uh, an older drawing you did called The Bridge of Houses. Oh, The uh, Bridge of Houses, right. Yeah. Um, so I was just hoping that you might shed some light on what you were thinking about no, that project. I worked on that for three years. That was the first to say that that structure running through the middle of Manhattan should be a public promenade, should be a public space, right? It was still, you know, I, was, I went up on that structure when they were still running a boxcar full of frozen turkeys. That was the last train on that bridge. And then it was over, and now it's an empty thing. And uh, Rudo Giuliani wanted to tear it down. And then Bloomberg came in to be mayor, psh, signed the keep the preservation order, and the rest is history. But in 1979 and 1980, I did a number of projects. And the one that's published everywhere is Bridge of Houses. And the idea was that it's a public promenade, but these kind of arches and these different types of houses. So it was the idea would also that it would be socially everybody that lives in New York City. So you have luxury apartments, you have SRO hotel, you have student dormitory, you have you know low cost. In other words, it's like a like a social line and a big public space. So yeah, that's a project that's very dear to my heart. And my I'm very happy that my office is at the top of the high line, so I can walk to work in the morning from my 32 Morton where I live up to the office, which is the whole length of the High Line. So I get to, you know, enjoy this great public. I mean, who would know that it would be that successful, right? I mean, it was kind of, so that, you know, that's, and the models, I think they're in the Museum of Modern Art and some other owners, but that was a, that was a beginning. And I think also as a lesson for young architects starting out, I didn't have any work. So I invented clients, I invented projects. But I didn't do them superficially. I did them with like passion, a lot of models. And I found a place, and we did an exhibition called Bridge of Houses, and there were like five models and drawings all over the wall. So, uh, you know, we invented the client. We didn't have any money. I was teaching. Uh, but almost all my work in the beginning, like Bronx Gymnasium Bridge, all those projects where we had to make the client up, invent the client. So I think that's also a way to start. Thank you. One more question, maybe. We're getting tired. OK, over there, wherever. Give him the mic. OK. 
I guess my main question would be like have, have to speak up. Sorry. Do you have any regrets like with your portfolio? And if there were any projects you could revisit, why and like what did you learn from them? Requests from what? Like regrets. 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 Sorry. Regrets. Yeah. I regret losing the competition in Berlin for the AGB. I mean, I regret all the competitions that I pour all my energy into and lost. But then again, I don't actually regret them because they were stepping stones of, you know, of work and joy. And actually, I'm having a giant show in Berlin opening on the 6th of February called Drawing as Thought at the Tochbaum Museum, which is a museum of architectural drawings in Berlin. And the, where they enter, where it enters, there's going to be like 10 drawings of the Berlin Library that I won, but they kicked me out. So I'm getting kind of a place in Berlin to kind of reconnect that first project from 1988, 89, uh, which would be the most regretful because it was just, you know, there were 13 architects all from America in that competition and I won and the, the building senator basically, you know, pushed, it, pushed us out. But so in Berlin, it'll be shown. And by the way, the wall came down and they never built anything. So, you know, I mean, it's not regret, it's just, uh, it's phases in life. I think, you know, you just look at them as passages and somehow they're kind of inspiring. Thank you. <laughs>